There we are. Are we on? Hello. All right. Like they're going to say hello back. All right. True or false? Choose. There is no middle way. So we come to that passage in John chapter 8 when we're familiar with that phrase when Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So I'm going to make some comments as we read through the passage and then I'll spend a little time at the end on this phrase, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So you remember uh, we're in the midst of Jesus really getting into it with the religious leaders, not just religious leaders, but also a bunch of the Jews as well. They want him dead. They're tired of him. They've called him demon possessed. They've called him crazy. They are, um, they're tired of him. And so Jesus is still standing up for what is true. And little do they know, he's six months away from dying for the sins of the world. And he is giving invitation after invitation after invitation. And they will not listen. Remember we talked about willful ignorance or willful unbelief. Remember the only unpardonable sin is unbelief. You remember the purpose, the overriding purpose of John's gospel. He and Luke are the ones who give a specific purpose for their gospels. John, in John chapter 20, verse 31, these words are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. Somebody ought to say amen. Listen, that's the overriding reason, and that's why John's gospel is not simply a story, but it's also an apologetic. Nothing to do with apologies but apologia, a defense, a logical defense of the Christian faith. And so that's why he records so many miracles and proofs of Jesus' works. Jesus said, as you well know, if you're not going to believe what I say, at least believe the works I have done, the feeding of the 5,000 and, the, and the 4,000, and then the raising of the dead and the healing of the sick. Listen, while he's saying these things, people are still alive who were, uh, who could have refuted these claims. That's one of the interesting things about the reliability of Scripture. I mentioned that to you last week. Enemy attestation. That's that literature that would be recorded during the same period of time that would refute what someone else is saying. So even in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, you know, where uh, he begins um, reciting that creed, that according to the scriptures, Jesus died, and then he rose again according to the scriptures. He appeared to uh, Cephas or Peter and so forth and so on, and even 500s, many of whom are still alive. So God is in essence saying, look, if you don't believe me, go ask the witnesses. Let them say that I'm a liar. And that's in essence what Jesus is saying too. They have no defense, as I told you last week. Not once do they refute what he's doing. They simply attribute it to Satan. Boy, he's about to turn that bus around. So let's start here with uh, verse 31. <clears throat> here we go. So to the Jews who had believed him, remember we picked up last week and it said, even though they were still angry with him and wanted to kill him, it said, while he was teaching, many still believed. So he looks at him and Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, oh, We're Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we'll be set free? So clearly their implication is with spiritual freedom or spiritual bondage because the Jews had been in bondage, oh man, all the way back to Egypt, right? And then later on, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Babylonians, and of course now, Rome is ruling the land. So this is clearly on the level of, you know, we've never been in bondage spiritually. We have our own monotheistic religion. <clears throat> so Jesus replied, very truly, verily, verily, this is the truth, I tell you. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Let that sink in for just a moment. I have there listed for you uh, out of Peter's second letter, chapter 2, verse 19. Many of the letters, I'd say most of the letters in our New Testament are written in response to false teaching. It took Satan no time whatsoever to say, you know what, I realize the gates of hell will not prevail against the gospel. I can't make it go away. What I can do is twist it a little bit. 
And so that's what he immediately did, and he's done the same thing since Eden. Remember, he, couldn't, he could not eliminate what God said. He just twisted it a little bit. Did God really say, you know? <clears throat> so <clears throat> Peter said the false teachers promise their listeners freedom. But while they themselves are slaves of depravity, and they, look at that, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. And so when we have an addiction of any kind, listen, addictions aren't necessarily just related to drugs, man. It can be television, sports, uh, some sort of hobby, uh, fill in the blank. So there are all kinds of things that have mastered us, and we need to see it as that and, and uh, allow God to remove it from us, those things that may um, affect healthy relationships, beginning with our relationship with the Lord. So Jesus goes on, <clears throat> he says, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. He's saying, listen, I'm free, I'm the son of God, and if you place your faith in me, you will also be free. He's saying, in essence, right now you're a slave to the power of sin and death. Only faith in me can set you free to be adopted into the family of God. Well, none of this is sitting well with his listeners. He goes on, verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Boy, I mean, everything is on Abraham. They are children of Abraham. It goes all the way back to Abraham. He says, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. Oh, wow. Let that sink in for just a moment. You think about the days, I'm sorry, the hours and minutes that we have in a day. And I've told you before, if Satan can't keep a person lost, he'll just keep a Christian busy. And he'll just try to squeeze out every opportunity for us to invest in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. He said later in John, we'll get there in, a, <laughs> in time, John chapter 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do Nothing. Abide in me. It's no different than you going back home, breaking a limb off one of your trees, and over time, over days, you just watch it slowly die. That's the same picture here. That's why we must be uh, in fellowship with the Lord daily. Daily, man. So, in verse 37, he says, look, I know that you're Abraham's descendants. There's a bloodline there. Yet you're looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. And you are doing what you have heard from your father. Oh boy, here we go. Abraham is our father, they answered. Jesus says, boy, don't you love it? Boy, Jesus doesn't back down. Now there were times when he specifically stayed silent. But boy... He could sure open up a can if he needed to. He says, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you're looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things as they are doing. You're doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Now, this is interesting because this is a backhanded cheap shot. Because the stories were still going around that Jesus was illegitimate. They're not buying that virgin story. And you know what? I would have to say if I were alive back then, it would, I, I'd have to really sort through that as well. But hopefully I would have seen the works of Jesus. And if he can heal a man who was blind and raise the dead, I'm going to go, you could probably be born of a virgin as well. But the Pharisees are taking a cheap shot. We're not illegitimate like you. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you'd love me. For I've come here from God. I've not come on my own. God sent me. <clears throat> and then he says, Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. Paul said the natural man, the man who is not saved, cannot hear the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. He goes on in verse 44. Ooh, boy, here we go. 
You belong to your father, who? The devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him, zero, nada. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. When we come back in January, I'll touch more on this passage. But tonight I want to focus more on that opening passage about Jesus being the truth. However, I do want you to see this quote. Neil Anderson's a theologian. He's a professional counselor. Look what he says. <clears throat> Freedom from spiritual conflicts and bondage. Any type of habitual habit, um, uh, ingrained habit of sin, lying, sexual sin, gossip, unforgiveness, anger, greed, etc. Just fill in the blank. Anything you may have a, a vice of some kind. But look what he says. Freedom is not a power encounter. It's a truth encounter. Now think about that, man. Say law. Pause. And think about that. We can't willpower ourselves out of sin. What did Jesus say? Willpower won't set you free. What will? The truth. Everybody say truth. Man, the truth will set you free. That's why even last night on the phone with, uh, with my kids in Nashville. I mean, they're still out of work. Times are hard. And uh, Michelle and I are just doing our best to encourage them and let them know we're going to make it. We are going to make it. And reminding Kelsey of things that we've, we've taught her since she was a child. And I told her, Kelsey, look, all biblical, our, all biblical counseling is is just reminding one another what is true. So me and your mom are just going to remind you what is true, baby. Now hang on to it. It's a truth encounter. Look what he says. Satan is a deceiver and he'll work undercover at all costs. Man, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. We don't see Satan coming down the road with that uh, devil's food under ham or whatever, you know, with the little pointy tail and the horns. He doesn't look like that, man. Paul said he comes disguised as what? An angel of light. Yeah. Sin looks good. It's pretty. Temptation looks harmless. Look where he goes. He says, but the truth of God's word exposes him and his lies. Man, that's when the light comes on and the cockroaches scatter. His demons are like little cockroaches that scurry for the shadows when the light comes on. Satan's power is in the lie. And when his lie is exposed by the truth, his plans are foiled. Satan's greatest success, one writer wrote, his greatest lie is in making people think they have plenty of time before they die to consider their eternal destiny. Folks, if you're listening online, I'm just telling you, man, don't put off considering the claims of Christ. Honestly investigate it. Take a hard look at it, man. Jesus is saying, what would it take for you to just give me a chance to prove to you that I am who I say I am? Please, and I say this primarily to them, but you also, if you have any questions, you just want to start a conversation, don't hesitate to contact me. In verse 45, Jesus continues, Yet, after he said, You're of your father the devil, a liar. Yet, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. In other words, you'll believe the liar, but you won't believe me, and I tell you the truth. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? This is interesting because Pilate said to the crowd as Jesus was on trial in front of them that morning of his crucifixion, I find no guilt in this man. Judas regretfully said to the religious leaders, I have betrayed an innocent man. At his trial, two witnesses couldn't even agree on their accusations, and the centurion at the cross said, Surely this was the Son of God. We have witness after witness after witness who testified to the sinlessness and innocence of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'll give you a chance. Prove that I'm a sinner. They couldn't. And then he says, if I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, here's what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Oh, they thought they were a shoe in man. They're Abraham's descendants. But he's saying, <laughs> you can be in Abraham's family tree all you want, but that doesn't mean you belong to God. You're adopted into the kingdom of heaven solely by placing our faith. In Jesus Christ. Anything less, uh, 
than just placing our faith into what and who he is, well, it nullifies the cross. It means the cross doesn't matter. We can't help ourselves in. Our good works are never going to outweigh our bad works. We're bad to the bone. But because Jesus faced the king of death and conquered him, everything is different. So Jesus has just turned the tables on their accusing him of being demon-possessed and told them they're not merely demon-possessed by a child, but a child of the devil himself. So never have the Jews been spoken to like this. How dare Jesus say something like this? You know, Galatians 4.16. Man, jot that down, Galatians 4.16. This is when Paul is confronting the Galatians. You know, they've... In chapter 3, I think, he says, who has bewitched you? You know, he's taught them uh, um, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You can't earn it. And uh, the false teachers came in, and he said, man, you were running such a good race. What happened? And um, in chapter 4, verse 16, he says, look, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Well, that's what Jesus is doing, man. He's making a lot of enemies. But man, I'd really die. I'd rather die telling the truth. <clears throat> and that's what's going to happen to Jesus. So since they're children of the devil, they're not children of God. We remember from last week, the week before, it was C.S. Lewis who said Jesus is either God or he's not. There is no middle way. And that's what I meant by my title, true or false, choose. There is no middle way. Jesus is either who he said he is, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the light of the world, the bread of life, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, or he's a lunatic. Because no sane man would say the things that Jesus said. Choose. There is no middle way. So let's unpack the text just a little bit. <clears throat> Verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching... You're really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth set you free. I want to tell you part of a story. I'll finish it up at the end. Nancy Piercy actually spoke right here in this pulpit about two years ago when we had that unapologetics conference. She is absolutely brilliant. She's one of the apologetics professors at Houston Baptist where I did my grad studies. Uh, insanely intelligent, very articulate, an outstanding author. Very heady. Um, I, she's the type of author I have to read every page about twice to, to understand it. In her book, Finding Truth, she tells this story. She says, I was once invited to give a presentation on Capitol Hill on the application of Christian worldview principles in the public arena. During the question period, the audience hushed in surprise as a congressional chief of staff stood up and announced, quote, I lost my faith at an evangelical college. This would be like Howard Payne, Waylon, Hardin Simmons. Not at a secular university, not in political battles on Capitol Hill, but at a respected evangelical college. How did it happen? Afterward, Piercy said, I sought out the chief of staff to hear his story. He explained, his name's Bill, Bill explained that the professors at his college had taught the prevailing theories in their discipline, most of which were secular and sometimes explicitly anti-Christian. So Satan had infiltrated, right, the, whole, the old Trojan horse strategy to just twist Christianity enough to plant deep seeds of doubt and cause people who had professed their faith to leave their faith. It's quite brilliant, actually. That's why Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, folks. That's why we're here. That's why we come on Sundays. That's why you listen online, man. If we don't know the truth, we can't, we are without excuse when we end up somewhere else. The truth will set you free. So she goes on. He said they did little to offer a biblical perspective on the subject. Met, Bill met with several of the professors outside of class, always asking the same question. He said, how do you relate your faith to your academic discipline to what you teach in the classroom? Tragically, not one professor could give him an answer. In other words, how does their, 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 their Christian faith, how does it translate into their everyday life and the way they teach? I don't know. 
These are professors at an evangelical college. Eventually, Bill concluded that Christianity did not have any answers. His professors didn't have any answers. Jesus must not either. And he decided to abandon it. Quote, I was sorry to give up my Christian faith, but it seemed to have no intellectual foundation. And folks, that's why uh, so many of our teens and 20-somethings and 30-somethings have no interest in uh, the Christian faith, the biblical worldview. They can't find people who will even talk to them about their hard questions. That's why, that's, that's why I do that so much. I'll always respect uh, uh, their opinions, even if it's hostile toward the Christian faith, as long as they will respect my worldview and we can enter just into an intelligent conversation where Christianity is concerned. It is a defensible faith. Professors at MIT and Stanford and Brown University and Yale and Harvard will all attest to that who have placed their faith. Francis Collins, Nobel, Peace, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner in science, uh, will tell you the same thing. He said, science led me to my faith in God, the one-time atheist said. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You've been to class, right? And they told you a test is coming up. All the answers are in the chapter here that I've assigned to you. If you want to know what the answers are, study the material. But do you know that biblical illiteracy is at an alarming rate today because no one studies the material? And I say no one. I don't mean that in a blanket type statement. But do you know what I mean. I meet adults all the time, and I'll begin talking about something they have no clue what I consider to be fundamental tenets of the Christian faith. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. I mean, you guys are the ones who are here. So I just want to encourage you and let you know that it matters. What you're doing matters. Man, hold on to the teaching, man. Get into the Bible. Study it. Wrestle with it. Ask the hard questions. Jesus said, knock and the door will be answered. Seek and you will find. He's not afraid of being analyzed or put under the microscope. It's interesting Jesus said, hold to my teaching, because in Acts, you know, we see the birth of the New Testament church. All heaven breaks loose, right? And we see here in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 42, after Peter's great sermon, those who accepted Peter's message of the gospel were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Look what they did. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' what? Teaching. In this social, media, personal, opinion-driven culture, we are in desperate need of truth. The great theologian Foghorn Leghorn used to say, I, it's more, I say it's more confusing than a termite and a yo-yo. Which way is up? Sometimes our world gets so turned upside down, well, we don't know which way is up. COVID's got us pretty discombobulated, doesn't it? Talked to a fellow pastor today. We were talking about, man, what's your church doing? What's our church doing? And he said, you know, this is what we're doing today, but it's, it evolves every day. And so it's, it's got us all on shaky ground. Satan is a smooth operator. He usually includes a nugget of truth in his lies, and that's why it's hard to tell when he's lying. That's why we've got to know the truth, men. Kids, teenagers. Oh. I saw a, a, a quote one time from a, a former youth pastor professor. Um, he said, look, these student ministries that at best offer pizza and games and then a little bitty this deep devotional, you know, before they leave. He said, these kids are learning physics and chemistry at school. They can study theology at church. Yeah, expect, expect it. Listen, when I come in here and I do my teaching, I know I'm not, you know, I'm not the best teacher you've ever heard. I, I know that. But when I leave here and before I come in, I expect for God to change us. I do, man. I, I pray that we'll walk out of here more like Christ than when we got here, and I know I'll have nothing to do with that. I promise you that. I'm not trying to be magnanimous or anything. Oh, I could go into so much of the, uh, a few um, examples of this slick rhetoric. 
Well, I can tell you this one. This is a good one. Sometimes you'll hear the phrase, only science can discover truth. Well, to the average Christian, you're going, well, that must be true, I guess. But Andy Bannister, who um, is, he's Canadian, and he works with the Robbie Zacharias uh, Defending Christian Faith Ministry, he said the claim only science can discover truth is self-refuting as the statement itself cannot be verified using science. Slick rhetoric. <laughs> oh, man. Paul Copen is a philosopher. He's a Christian philosopher at a secular university in Florida. He said, what is truth? It's like the attachment on a socket wrench. Guys, some of you gals, you know, these tools that we use to fix cars and, and whatever else, these socket wrenches, and you, and you find the right socket that you put on the wrench that will fit the, the bolt, right? So he said, what is truth? It's like the attachment on a socket wrench that fits or matches the bolt the mechanic is trying to tighten. It fits. Similarly, truth is a matchup between beliefs and reality. Now stay with me. Truth makes reality make sense. I've told you before, it was Greg Kokel who uh, wrote his book, um, The Story of Reality, I believe. But he said, in any worldview, Christianity, biblical worldview, or anything else, atheistic worldview, there are four basic questions. Where did we come from? What went wrong? How do we fix it? And where do we end up? I can tell you, man, the biblical worldview does a better job of answering those questions than any other worldview on planet Earth. So Copen said, truth is a matchup between beliefs and reality. A belief fits or corresponds to what is actually the case. So to say that the moon, this is good, is, so to say that the moon is made of cheese is false because it doesn't match up with what we know the moon to really be made up of. So anybody can say there is no God or there is a God, but it's the, it's the, uh, uh, the spaghetti head. I, there's these, these different crazy worldviews, and you can go, okay, man, you're free to believe whatever you want, but let's see what matches up best with reality. Let me quote a couple of former atheists that you've heard of. Lee Strobel, the Yale Law School grad, author of Case for Christ, he said, I'll admit it, I was ambushed by the amount and quality of the evidence that Jesus is the unique Son of God. This was while he was trying to dispute and disprove the resurrection so that he could talk his wife out of the uh, salvation experience she had just had. He said, I shook my head in amazement at the amount of evidence. I had seen defendants carted off to the death chamber on much less convincing proof. The cumulative facts and data pointed unmistakably toward a conclusion that I wasn't entirely comfortable in reaching. Now, he's digging deep, right? And he's finding the truth, and the truth ended up setting him free. Alistair McGrath, he's also another one of my favorite uh, authors. Jordan and I actually saw him at uh, Lubbock Christian University at an event in 2013. Former ardent atheist, brilliant Oxford professor, PhD in molecular biophysics. He says, quote, I became a Christian at the age of 18 while studying chemistry at Oxford University. My conversion related to my perception that, look, Christianity offered a more comprehensive, coherent, and compelling account of reality than the atheism I had embraced in my earlier teenage years. It's the right socket on the wrench. And Jesus is trying to show the Jews, look, you've had the wrong socket and the wrong wrench for so long. I am trying to show you what fits best with what reality you live in. Paul warned the Ephesians to study the scriptures so that they could safely discern what was true from what was wasn't. As a result, he said, we won't be tossed and blown away by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. Do you get that? Folks, I tell you all the time, DL would agree with this 100%. You can get on YouTube and find some very, very 
famous preachers who are not preaching the truth. It sounds like the truth, but it's not. Keep us accountable. The Bereans, as I've told you many times before in Acts 17, studied the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was teaching was true. Satan is a smooth operator, man. So we will not be influenced if we hold to the teachings of Christ when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like truth. Don't be deceived or beguiled into believing what someone espouses just because it sounds convincing. Weigh everything against Scripture. What is truth? The Bible tells us. The truth is Jesus. You know, it's interesting. I read a, a quote the other day. Because of Google smartphones, Kids especially are fact-checking Christian speakers and preachers all the time. So, listen, and I, I know this, especially as I am uh, um, teaching online. Boy, they can get their phone immediately and say, he just said something, I better make sure. So my credibility is on the line. My reputation is on the line. So that's why I do a great deal of time preparing and making sure if I say something, uh, it better be right. I better have some biblical support for what I'm saying. The truth is in Jesus, and here's what Paul wrote. He said, so I tell you this to the Ephesian believers and insist on it in the Lord. Man, he's saying, look, no, the, the gloves are off, man. He said that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. The non, in essence, in today's language, the non-Christians. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Verse 20. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You see, I have it also listed for you there. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17 to his Father, your word is what? Truth. Truth. In Psalm 119, 160, the psalmist wrote, The sum of your word is what? Truth. And then, of course, Jesus in John 14, 16, on the night before he was crucified, he told his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So let's bring this to a close. I, truth matters, my friends. It matters in every aspect of life. When anything is elevated above truth, good things even, that we consider good, then everything crumbles. In conclusion, in John 18, 37 through 38, Jesus answered to Pilate, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate asked his famous question, what is truth? C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, I've read a number of times, he said, nearly all that we call human history is in actuality the long history of man trying to find something other than God that will make him happy. We're scared of the truth, right? Because the truth of the gospel starts out with bad news. <laughs> that we are hopeless sinners, depraved. That's what makes the good news the good news. You know, there's some people who say, I'm not bad, and I'll try to, but the best way I can explain, I always have, I did this in youth ministry, of describing in, in some sense of simplicity our sin nature. This is what we call our natural desire to sin. This would be con contrary to those who say, I'm, I'm really a good person. In my heart, I'm a good person. <laughs> the Bible says there's none good, not one, not one righteous. We all rebel. Through the prophet Jeremiah, he said the heart of man is deceitfully wicked and beyond cure. I mean, that's pretty bad news. And that's what makes the good news the good news. But I'll tell them, look, did anyone ever have to teach you how to lie? Did anyone ever have to teach you how to lust, how to gossip, how to smirk? How to talk back. No. No. It all comes quite naturally, doesn't it? Well, in John chapter 1, 
We reach way back there. John wrote, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in chapter 16, on the night before he'd be crucified, Jesus, speaking of the promised Holy Spirit, said, But when he, the Spirit of what? Truth. Comes, he will guide you into all the what? Truth. I want to, I had one, one person come up to me after one of these lessons, so convicted. They, they, they had a hard time looking at me. I said, what's wrong? They said, you keep talking about biblical illiteracy, and I am so biblical, biblically illiterate. I don't know almost all of this. I said, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> it's never too late to start. That's the great thing about Christianity, man. He can change you in a moment. Start now. All he needs is a willing heart. It's never too late to read and learn how to understand and apply your Bible. I try to, I try to get people, I'll phrase it that way. Man, let's fall in love with our Bibles all over again. I like in Proverbs chapter 2 in the Message Bible. I don't use a lot from the Message Bible, but every now and then it's, it really is good. Solomon wrote, Search for truth and wisdom like a prospector panning for gold. Like an adventurer on a treasure hunt. You know, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl hidden in a field. The way we would look for a lost wallet or a lost phone, man. Set aside just a moment per day and manage to search for the kingdom of heaven. Let God speak to you. Hold on to his teaching. Oh, man. So what happened to Bill in that earlier story on Capitol Hill? Bill on Capitol Hill. How does Bill's story end? Well, I'm glad you asked. After graduating from college, he discovered there is a field called apologetics, Christian apologetics, a logical defense of the faith. I told you before, 1 Peter 3.15, where Peter said, and always be ready to give a logical defense for your faith. But do this with gentleness and respect. Logical defense, the Greek word apologia, from which we get our English word apologetics. So he said, I learned about this apologetics that supports Christian claims and logic and reasons. <clears throat> he said to Nancy Piercy, he said, I began to read books by C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, Alvin Plantinga, brilliant philosopher, Notre Dame, Christian, William Lane Craig, one of the greatest defenders of the faith today, brilliant philosopher and theologian, and many others. Eventually, Piercy says, about Bill. She said eventually he was persuaded that Christianity does have the intellectual resources to respond successfully to competing worldviews after all. He said to Piercy, I studied my way back to God. He held on to the truth and the truth set him free. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for these wonderful people. I ask you, God, to convict our hearts, Lord, to hold tightly onto your word. God, knowing that's where the truth is. You are the truth. It's flawless. Your word is flawless. It is perfect. And it is your revelation of yourself to us. So God, help us to read it, to study it, to memorize it, to hide it in our heart that it might not sin against you. Oh, God, thank you for the treasure of your word. May we seek it as a prospector panning for gold, as an adventurer seeking a treasure. Oh, God, thank you. We love you, and we continue to pray for all those affected by this virus, and we ask you for a cure. This is our prayer in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> We're done until January 13th. Church as usual on Sunday.